So once again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we just concluded the meditation. Uh, now we'll I'll, I'll do a talk, and this talk is mainly uh, in response to someone's request to speak on resilience. Uh, so I thought uh, the topic of refuge, the true meaning of refuge uh, from the Buddhist point of view is the resilience of all resilience. So uh, so that's that. So these days we are mainly uh, the, uh, use, choosing the topic of the talk mainly by people's requests. So if you have any particular requests, please uh, send them along as email and we'll, uh, I'll try to include them. Um, or oh, sometimes quite a lot of people write to me, but I, I, they, they think that I should be able to reply to them or something. That's not always possible because I, I have many other uh, commitment, and I don't believe in having a secretary who will answer my calls, anything like that. But uh, when I when I uh, give talks on Sunday morning, some of the queries people have asked, maybe I'll try to address them. Uh, so if you are if you're really uh, tuning in to these kind of transmissions, then hopefully the teachings usually answers many of the uh, questions uh, people have. Um, so the true meaning of refuge, uh, which is really what we call resilience. Um, if you look at the first of all, what what is the meaning of refuge? Refuge is where and what by doing we are safe. We are safe from maybe ex external dangers or, or uh, personal danger from people or, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, or maybe danger of one's own, and from the Buddhistic sense, danger of one's own karma, one's own behaviors, one's own afflictions, one's own thoughts are the probably one need to be saved. So true meaning of refuge. Uh, true meaning, meaning that there is a, there is a danger Danger of people, um, people uh, mistakenly thinking what is refuge, and if they think they took refuge in the triple gem, or then they think that Buddha or the Dharma or the Sangha or the teachers will uh, always make sure their lives and problems are saved, a problem, and expect them to do all the all the problems of that your own karma to be. To be saved by them, so that kind of uh, dualistic kind of expectation of external objects of refuge. Mm, firstly, it's very, it's very, very unlikely people recognize the true objects of refuge. Uh, so, firstly, they have the, have the objects of refuge got it wrong. Uh, uh, if secondly, what the, their own their own cause for, for which they go for refuge is probably not right. So that's why true meaning of refuge means first of all the objects of refuge or the three things that we take refuge in uh, <clears throat> are also one is relative and one is ultimate. So when we refer to the true meaning of refuge, meaning true objects of refuge, uh, true objects of refuge or true uh, or kind of a relative object. So a relative object is not ultimate object or refuge. So uh, when we say refuge object, we usually say th uh, three gems, three gems. Uh, the reason why it's called gems is very, gems are very rare and very difficult to find. If found, it has excellent qualities. So if you if you have you think you have refuge in the triple gem and some and uh, and so if you are not really finding any safer or better uh, with the practice that means uh, you you either haven't got the right objects for refuge or your own uh, your actual true meaning of going for refuge means uh, so the, um, even when we talk about the objects of refuge we say the Buddha the Dharma the Sangha has two one is relative. Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and one is ultimate. The relative Buddha is the, the fully enlightened historical Buddha. 
historical Buddha, uh, like the Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, but ultimate Buddha is is the uh, really realizing uh, your own inner uh, Dharmakaya and Rupakaya form of your mind. So uh, it's a real awakening of really awakening of your own mind. One who doesn't awaken one's own mind and then prays and and worships to some external Buddha is. Uh, probably functionable only as a culture of Buddhists do, you know. But true meaning of the refuge in the Buddha means you yourself have this amazing awakening, waking up, uh, that uh, your own realization of the qualities that constitute the Buddha, such as infinite compassion and wisdom, and then power to practice compassion with difficult sentient beings instead of resorting to childish reactions and rea- overreactions. So if you're able to uh, um, realize that, then you have the true sense of the refuge in the Buddha. Um, of course, uh, and that is then, then dependent on the true refuge in the Dharma. Uh, to dharma is also they have true, scriptural Dharma and realization Dharma. Scriptural Dharma, you have to study, you have to listen, you have to meditate, you have to become familiarized with the concepts and ideas and philosophy, what not. So that's the scriptural dharma. So it gives you some kind of academic or at least conceptual. But uh, but that's uh, that's only relative. True, true refuge in the dharma is realizational dharma. Realizational dharma is that you, you yourself, uh, are able to transform your mind and then use the teaching as a medicine to to cure your mental disposition that is tainted by cognitive and afflictive obscurations. So when you can get well, uh, your mind is getting well by adhering to the teachings of the Dharma through study, through learning to make an attitudinal shift and emotional tone has been softened and intellectually there's no, no lot of aggression and, and they have there's this amazing sh- uh, taming of your own mind to the extent of l- lessening of your greed, uh, hatred, and ignorance, and your objects of enmity has become objects of your compassion. If you have that, then you, that's a really refuge. Then you, because you meditate, because you study, because you learn the Dharma, it has completely empowered you to practice, to drop enmity and replace them with infinite compassion and forgiveness to oneself and other sentients beings, that is the true refuge of the Dharma. Then if people say Dharma helps, that's what it means. When they think along the, along the Dharma, they're able to drop the bad thoughts, bad positions, bad opinions, and uh, you know, negative thoughts they have. They have to recognize, they have to uh, cognitively recognize, oh, this is my deluded thoughts. It's not the him or them or that. Uh, and then the Dharma, Dharma t- restores your goodness and makes you safe from thinking it's them. And and as a result of that, you are, you, are, you are empowered by Dharma to get yourself well, not become, not become sick or suffer. So therefore, true meaning of refuge in the Dharma means our self is able to make huge shift and gallant effort to transform your mental constitution from negativity to restitution. And you completely feel absence of ill will and enmity in a wrong view of others or of even of your past. Even towards your past, you develop deep compassion to your past and people and then have the, have the power of practicing mercy and compassion to your past. And because Dharma has completely educated you, has boosted your fitness as a human being and became totally, truly humane, that is refuge. You know, uh, the ref- true meaning of refuge is you, when you yourself is completely empowered uh, to to change your attitude, recognize your your deluded attitudes, deluded attitude, and put them in the bin, in the delete delete basket, put them in a bin, bin, and instead try to put and download this this compassion basket. 
tolerance basket. And so that you are actually more equipped how to practice kindness and compassion. And your meditation is to to empower you to get that kind of clarified uh, conception, cognitivity, so you know exactly what thoughts and emotions, opinions drop, and what thoughts, feelings, emotions to adopt instead. That is the true refuge, what we call, uh, you know, true refuge means uh, niroda. Niroda Niroda means you have caused the cessation, cessation of enmity, cessation of wrong views, cessation of grasping to your deluded views as a correct view. And that putting a stop, and you have really had an amazing sense of safety. You're not going to be mauled by your own wrong views anymore from here onwards. And that is that what is the true meaning of refuge from the Dharma. Then, uh, then you realize your formal study and and uh, learning the concepts and the, uh, the books, teachings of the Dharma, and all of that become so important because the more you are familiarized with them, the more you will develop your, your realization. If you don't study or don't listen and don't read and don't meditate, you don't have any material to give you that kind of uh, understanding. So therefore, relative Dharma is the realized scriptural Dharma, text, concepts, and ideas, and philosophy, and, and those things are necessary. But the real refuge, true refuge, which is your own ability to change and, and tame your mind and behaviors and completely sort of therefore get rid of all the wrong views and afflictions to your, by your own cognition, by your own awareness. This kind of self-empowerment is the refuge in the Dharma, true refuge in the Dharma. And whether you recite many mantras or whether that came from your doing this reading or this retreat or taking some precepts or, and, guiding, and guarding them wholeheartedly, those things are just techniques. Those things are, real, those things are relative Dharma. Relative means there's a relative to different individuals. Some people will have to do that. Other people will do different things. There's no one methodology that's going to fix to everyone. So the true refuge in the Dharma, uh, Dharma can make yourself become self-reliable. You can call self-resourceful. You become so completely resourced. And in the more, how do you build, get the resource from meditation, through self-discipline, through through study? If you have no study and meditation and uh, and listening and reading, then you don't have the actually the raw material to develop the actual inner resources. So the realization dharma comes from the causes of realization. Realization is the teaching, the instructions, the meditation, the sadhana, mantra, those practices that you do, uh, uh, even though they may be quite a, quite a bit of a tedious having to do daily uh, regularly, but what, whether you st- it's study that you do a couple of hours or you meditate for of a certain amount of the time in every day, whatever they are. During those times when you're doing it, it's quite a requirement, quite a commitment. But slowly the, the good blessings, the very, remember, gem is very rare that you have really then have a pearl of wisdom drops from those practices one day or, or some hours, and then you realize ever since that penny dropped, and then you completely have now empowered never to resort to wrong views or ill will or aggression or retaliation or all of that. Then you have true meaning of ref- true refuge. You know, those people who think that refuge is in traditions or teachers, they never has been mentioned in the Buddha Dharma their refuge object. Yet they themselves, firstly, taking refuge in the wrong objects. Buddha never said take refuge in people or high positions or titles or, or, or culture or lineages or schools or traditions. A lot of people are uh, worshipping people and institutions and then they get disappointed because if you, you have, firstly, they never are objects of refuge. Buddha said, take refuge in the triple gem. Don't rely on people, rely on Dharma. But when you take refuge in the people, you can only get problem because people have karma. You know, people are born with karma and afflictions. Otherwise, they wouldn't be thronging with you, rubbing shoulders with you. So don't expect, don't idealize people. Even though in Vajrayana Buddhism they say, oh, you should, you should test your teacher for 12 years. If you test two years, you will find faults in him or her. If you don't find any, anyone with faults, you, you wouldn't be in this world. 
So don't take refuge in people. It never says you take refuge in the people. Even when the idea of, of uh, uh, adhering to teacher and sangha is not because they are free of fault, because they are our companion. They too have fault. They too have many learned experiences of their, their, uh, their frailties. And therefore, we learn how did they cope or are trying to cope with their difficulties. So, it's, so don't get wrong. The true refuge is not teacher or lineages or schools or, or even root or lineage gurus. That's a Vajrayana concept. That's a completely different matter. When you have this initiated, when you have the power to see everybody as a Buddha, then of course it's quite a, quite a different thing. You don't have to examine anybody. Nobody exists in the first place, whether that's with fault or without fault. It's quite a different way of looking. When we talk about refuge here in conventional Buddhist world, but that other Buddhist schools, common and Mahayana and Theravada, they all will talk about refuge in the triple gem. They don't talk about f- f- quadruple gem or, or, or six gems, you know, I mean, like, to, like Tibetan Buddhists have four-line refuge prayer, six-line refuge prayer. And this can be confusing for people because, uh, because that's, how, that's how the whole... Uh, they, they, they think they should take refuge in the Lama or a lineage. Uh, and that's, that's how the word Lamaism came, because people mistakenly think they should take refuge. How, Lamas themselves are human beings. They may be shaven, or they may be sitting on a high throne, and they may be, have amazing robe or how many, many followers, but they still are human beings. So don't ever take refuge in Lamas. You know, they are, if you take refuge in Lama, you will not get blessings. If you take refuge in the Lama as embodiment of the Buddha, you may get the blessings because you don't take refuge in the Lama. You take refuge in the la- Even Lama is a representation of the triple gem. For those who really know the true Buddha gem and Dharma gem, Sangha gem embodied in the, in the Lama or even Yidam. Even deities uh, are embodiment of the triple gem let alone the Lama. And Lama is also embodiment of the Triple Gem. Now, if you try to take refuge in the uh, Lama more than the Triple Gem, you have got it wrong. It's, it will soon be disappointingly wrong. It will cause division. Why is Tibetan Buddhism so fragmented? Because people are so much em- overemphasizing the lineage and Lamas without talking about the, the, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Without taking refuge in the Triple Gem, they're taking refuge in this the other uh, sort of uh, other kind of paraphernalia or concepts. So it's very important. The true meaning of refuge is called Tri Ratna. Three means three, not four. You know, don't mistake three with four and three with six. Three is three. One, two, three. Buddha is one, Dharma is two, and Sangha is three. So that even when we say we take refuge in the Buddha, doesn't mean the whole Buddha with his infinite compassion and wisdom will protect you from all your karma and difficulties. And no, no Buddha has done that before. If he has done that, then everybody who has joined the refuge, then they should have known a problem. Buddha doesn't save you from anything. But bu- when we say refuge in the Buddha, means that's a relative refuge in the Buddha. Ultimate refuge in the Buddha, true refuge in the Buddha, means you yourself have to evolve in, and grow and unfold like a Buddha on however slow the, the pace might be. So therefore, Buddha's qualities and uh, wisdom is cause of inspiration. So believing in the Buddha as much as we can on the basis of face value or tradition or believe what you have is the ref, uh, that you have refuge. But that Buddha, refuge in the Buddha will be, uh, uh, will be totally dependent on your own realization of Dharma. Because even Buddhahood achieved from realizing Dharma. So your practice of Dharma is going to authenticate and validate the Buddha, Buddha's infinite compassion, wisdom, and power. So the one who has true refuge, refuge in the, the refuge in the triple gem, the more they study, more they practice, more they understand Dharma, the more they know how to change their tame their own mind, you know. And they drop some of the negative habits, not just physical, outer social habits that people make noise about, but that's quite a uh, different thing, you know. 
outer behavior is one thing, but inner attitude that you yourself knows needs a real improvement. Inner attitude, when you yourself has changed and modified that, then you feel so much safer without any enmity. Even if someone is really angry and aggressive to you, you don't have slightest enmity towards them. Why? Because you know compassion uh, is the most important uh, remedy. And that, therefore, changes your heart from uh, holding, brooding enmity. Instead, you give rise to compassion. Because you are able to, then you are really, then you really are, have refuge in the Buddha because you realize, realize how much um, many more times compassionate the Buddha is. Even when we as a practitioner do small amount of compassion, how quickly can we allay our enmity and ill will towards others? And, uh, and see them with great care and compassion of mind. When we do that, then we have refuge. We are safe. Now, if you, if you, the resilience, the resilience is that if you, if your resilience needs to come from your ha having the uh, understanding of compassion, how to practice compassion. When people are, uh, are uh, frightened by like a pandemic disease or, or whatever difficulties there are, but we're too attached to our comfort and what we think we are so used to having. So things like this kind of universal suffering caused by pandemic, we have to be resilient in terms of the these sufferings are not some kind of a uh, unrelated to your own personal karma you know the pandemic is one but how it affects to everybody is depending to how they themselves are karmically predisposing so if you have resilience like if you have refuge in the triple gem particularly in the dharma gem you you you, you realize how many millions are more uh, terribly suffering and affected by this pandemic, unlike me in a place like Australia where we live. Here we're talking about 104 people died last three months. Some places, every city is losing that much every day for the last, last three months. Just think about that. Resilience really means that how should we draw the inner strength to, do, to, to impart compassion towards others who are suffering more than us and not thinking, poor me, why me? The one who does no longer have to say, why me, is one who has refuge in the triple gem. One actually is asking, why me, from the other way around, saying, why am I am so fortunate, unlike any other beings like that. And isn't it, my, isn't it a great challenge, test for me to do something to benefit others? Why always I'm ruled by my own opinions and making me suffer, making me push and making me myself unskillful, uh, what I say or do. Why am this? So th when you do know that, you therefore realize you instead of being useful to useful with your safety uh, from uh, outside dangers, you're actually thinking that I I'm also affected by this, and even the smallest way that is affected by this is to dismiss them totally and have think yourself big and think on the other areas. When you have that, that kind of skillfulness of the strategizing your mind is a refuge, is a resilience. Resilience is not denying or rejecting the problems. Resilience is learning to, to become more skillful in accepting those uh, difficulties as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a call for our, our generosity, our humility, our compassion, our selflessness, and being able to practice them, then you will feel the resilience. Your resilience has empowered you to uh, not to scream and yell, poor me, why me? But, but why not? Why, why shouldn't be? I'm e very beautifully equipped with precious human rebirth. I have Dharma. I have studied this, this many books. I read many of these teachings. They all tell, you, tell me what to do. And, and this is the very moment that I should practice. The, uh, you know, in the very midst of crisis, if you really realize the preciousness of the Dharma and realize it, then you have true refuge. 
If you are among the many just screaming and reacting and, and overreacting uh, and to, about the world and as if this has never happened before, you haven't got a clue of refuge. You haven't got the refuge at all. It's just merely intellectual, conceptual refuge. Maybe a ceremony that you went through that you think you had refuge since. You had not studied properly. You have never put your, 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 your effort to practice strong enough to realize the preciousness of Dharma. It's incredible once you realize the Dharma. You know, why waste the Dharma in, in addressing some of your own little, little problems? You should use the understanding of Dharma to understand the universal suffering that the world is going through. When you have that, you will develop really resilience. You will develop a kind of resistance from not being harmable. It's like a waterproof jacket. The water wouldn't go through your jacket because you are wearing that jacket. Likewise, you have refuge and that will not you know, get through you. It will, it will bounce back. It will make you even stronger. That is when you have refuge in the Dharma. Uh, then, if you have refuge in the Guru or somebody, you're praying to him that he will save you or something. In your dream, they might save you. They never do. They never said they will do. But it's only skillful means the blessing, they say, oh, the guru will bless you or something. Bless you means when you are faith and devotion and practice, it will change you. That's what it means. When you think strategically and creatively, it will change you. That's the blessings. They say, the faith, unless faith evaporates, no shower of blessings will come. So when we are convinced the truthfulness of Dharma, uh, unless we get that conviction, which is very r- difficult, like a gem. Gem is rare, isn't it? That conviction comes from your own genuine practice. The more genuinely you practice, you have this amazing conviction in the law of cause and effect and how true the Dharma is. And how true the Dharma is, and particularly not just believing, each time you practice when it's really, really difficult. Practicing Dharma at very, really difficult and and adhering to it is resilience. That is refuge. Just be, be, be reciting a few pages every day, doing a couple of rounds of mala every day, that's just a, that is a, just a temporary refuge. That's just a form. That's the form of dharma. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. That should be kept. But you should always see, I'm doing this every day, but I need to, me to develop true, genuine kindness and compassion and tolerance and understanding of each other and be kind, skillful in what one does, what one says, what one doesn't do, that has a ramification to other people. That's the resilience. Resilience actually gives you a lot of space, clarity, and therefore, as a result of that, then your, 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 your true sangha, true refuge of sangha, you know, when we talk about true sangha, true sangha is bodhisattvas who have reached, at, Buddha, arats and bodhisattvas who have at least reached certain levels of realization, what pa, no more eternal, arathood and bodhisattvas of first or second bhumi. They are only objects of refuge, but still only their objects of refuge. But real refuge in the Sangha is realizing how clear and empty your self is, of the ordinary self is. Now, now don't mistake when we say there is no self, uh, uh, that it means actually no self. We're talking about the mistaken concept of self does not exist. There isn't an identical, there isn't a permanent, independent a unitarily existing cell. That's what the teaching says, there's no cell. It isn't saying there is no George or there's no Mary or there's no Susan or there's no, no this. Of course, there's merely labeled self, um, a person who has a body and a feeling and address and, and particular wishes. Of course, you have. You, you, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not going to sort of empty every, cancel everybody's uh, selfhood. And from that point of view, you know, it will be very nice nihilistic anyway. So when Buddhism says there's no self, uh, it isn't saying uh, that uh, uh, there isn't a conventional self. Of course there is. But grasping it as truly independently existing is does not exist. Uh, 
It, it is saying there is a um, there is a kind of token self named after your yeah your color or gender or profession. But of course, you have lost lists of things that after which you yourself identifies too. But if self itself is not truly identifiable, there isn't a unitary independent permanent existing self you know even if you uh, even if you um, you think you you uh, you have five uh, or five amazing friends and two very difficult people maybe you call enemy so just try to see how much of the of the five friend selves of two enemy self exists how long was your friend friend uh, how recent was these people became your friend you will see they have been became friend only say a couple of years before that you don't even know. You only had one friend, now you have five. And so therefore, there wasn't a truly existing friend that was five right from the very beginning. It is totally dependent on what you regard as a person as a friend. You know, it's not that they are truly friend to you. If you tell them you're my friend, they say, oh, are you? I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I didn't know you were treating me as a friend. So friend is only a concept. It's not truly exist. Like that, yourself also is merely labeled, merely conceptualized. So when you don't understand that, mm, then you, you, can, you have every danger of mistaking the Buddhist concept of no self as, as if it's denying existence of conventional self. No, it is, it is refuting the mistaken identity of self being permanent, independent, and unitarily existing. So these these three this th event, but most people have this wrong clinging, as if the self was independent, permanent, and truly existing, and all of their views and grasping to the gender or or profession or name. As a result of this, they suffer. Why? Not because there isn't a kind of a conventional self, but because the one is mistake mistakenly thinking the convention is truly permanently inherently existing self. So. So when we say sangha, sangha is the is the one who 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 who, who is able to see clearly um, that of na that luminous nature of his mind, which is neither yellow or red or male or female, but nevertheless this ever cognizant cognizable awareness. This that is the this uh, one who realizes uh, this mind might then. Uplift himself, upgrade himself to be a realized Sangha. The realized Sangha is one who realizes the emptiness of self. Unless he realizes emptiness of self, he's not a Sangha. So, therefore, uh, when you rec recognize or witness the luminosity of your mind, there is a chance of true refuge because otherwise, you are going to grasping. How do you know you're grasping to the self as truly existing? You're so attached to your views and point of views and ideas, and you're suffering your, uh, you know, uh, opinion addiction. You know, so that is the problem of the self addiction. One. When we, Buddhism says there no truly exists self, means you should be a bit easy about those things. Don't get so addicted with your opinions and views. And uh, so that shows the true cause of suffering is the misconception of self. So maybe we should say that there is a self, misconceived self. The misconception of self is the cause of suffering. True conception of self is luminosity. Okay, there is true conception of luminous self, that is luminosity. Okay, luminosity means it doesn't start here and finish here. You know, it, is, it isn't going to be measured in tapes or weighed in scale or, or photographed with, the, with your smart camera. No, you, it is not within the domain of your, your five sense faculties. So, that's, so that is luminosity. So we're not, say, we're not saying uh, there isn't a luminosity. That luminosity itself, when you investigate, it does not start here, finish here. You know, it is, it is not findable. So because it is not something you can spot, uh, something you can measure or wear or take a photograph of, uh, therefore we are saying it's empty of our normal five sense faculty domain. Uh, but it is not that empty, empty of emptiness itself, you know. You know, it's just, so. But so, therefore, 
it's still the very awareness and cognitivity of awareness is there. So the true refuge, true meaning of refuge in the Sangha is one who have this kind of uh, uh, reflexive cognitivity of the luminosity of, of the mind. You know? And that reflexive cognitivity of luminosity mind of yourself and others are not different. You know, not, it doesn't yours start here and someone else start there. It's not like that. They are, they are boundless, infinite, and and this is beyond expression. <coughs> when you meditate, sometimes it may, may culminate to that realization, however short that it is. Usually that's the kind of, a, they say the, the luminosity is the gap between past thought and future thought. And when, that's, when you're meditating, you are trying to capture that. And uh, so one who has realized that uh, is a true refuge. But when you take refuge in the conventional Sangha, conventional Sanghas are not a refuge object, okay? Don't mistake. Even though they are, they are, uh, they may, uh, they are, they are shaven. They wear robes. They've been monk or nun for forty years. They still have their own karma, affliction. You will see how how they how they go in everyday life. They are just as another human person. Uh, maybe they have a bit more commitment to their uh, as the precepts or list of things. They how long they pray, how long, how much they don't uh, do worldly things, and how much they pray, and how much. Of course, there is there are certain things, but that doesn't mean they are refuge objects. They are your companions. So don't mistake in your fellow deluded monks and nuns. You know, um, I don't want mean to say that disrespectful, but just trying to say, make a cray. So the true refuge is not Sangha who have who have who have suffering of aggregates, who have suffering of afflictions. Uh, you don't take refuge in them. So you take refuge in the exalted Sangha, Arya Sangha, exalted Sangha, those who reach Arahathood and above first, second Bhumi onwards. So therefore, there is, when you have that, there's no disappointment to see the Sanghas have faults and karma and afflictions. You will practice compassion like a nurse. If a fellow nurse gets sick, nurse, is there any nurse saying, oh, you shouldn't get sick, you're a nurse. Do you do that? I mean, nurses, most of the doctors also got cancer, not only the nurses. So you wouldn't have any nurses to, to get treatment from or doctor to work from. If you, if you idealize, your doctor should be free from illness, nurse should be free from illness. Buddha said, Sanghas are companions. He's referring to the Sanghas as mostly who are part of accumulation, part of preparation. Only those who are part of seeing and above are your object of Sangha, uh, object of refuge Sangha. But even if you take refuge the object of you know, those exalted Sangha, until you realize your own clarity of mind, no matter how clear-minded the Arya Sanghas are, where are they? You know, how I, why aren't you able to call them? Why can't you get instruction from them? You know, so until we realize our own <laughs> clarity and luminosity of mind, uh, how how ideal sangha can help you. You know, even you you see some sangha perform miracles and in front of you, that will be it, just a spectacle. That's it. After that, what can he do? What can he do? Buddha said, "You are your own master." So triple gem doesn't mean the Buddha gem or Dharma gem or Sangha gem will come and save you from your, your karma as if someone is going to clean your backyard. Nobody does. No triple gem does that. They're too rare to do that. And also people liken uh, as if there was many people who got enlightened. I'm not suggesting there aren't, but they, are, they have no one since Shakyamuni Buddha who got fully enlightened. Some may have got arathood, some may have uh, once returner, non-returner, maybe second Bhumi, third Bhumi. Sure, there they may be plenty, but they never have been like the Buddha. Buddha is so rare. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so rare, isn't it? Rare and excellent, they call it. Historical Shakyamuni Buddha must be uh, the center of our objects of refuge. It should not be relegated by lineages or some teachers or great patron master who came in the middle of 14th century or 12th century or even 7th century. How about all the last 2,600 years the lineage of the Buddha? We should always put, the, put Shakyamuni Buddha as the, as the, as the top 
top of our object's refuge. And his dharma, and then we realized, and sangha are those who have reached the hara. So then there is no cause for fragmentation of Buddhism into schools, lineages, and tradition biased through different schools, because these schools are nothing, nothing to school. They haven't got anything other than the middle way, uh, teaching behaviorally nonviolence. I would say, uh, and philosophy-wise, philosophy of the Buddhist teaching is a middle way and a law of interdependent origination. And the meditation is always calm abiding and union of calm abiding, special inside meditation. Whether they use deity yoga or mantra or just merely simple breathing and silence practice is just a different emphasis uh, of the different uh, different hours. Uh, a stream of Buddhist teacher practices, but in the end. Uh, True refuge, true meaning of refuge is where you you have amazing sort of, sort of uh, I would say gradual awakening and unfolding of your mind. Uh, so then you can actually see the yourself is is uh, uh, as gradually awakening, uh, experiencing the awakening of the Buddha in you. Uh, if you are if you are maturing, uh, if you are awakening and you are waking up from the sleep, uh, from one sleep to another another wakeful and from from that sleep, from that wakefulness, you realize you have to even wake full. Wake. Previously, we thought it was all other, uh, other people's fault. And now we wake up, no, they are not other people's fault. They are only our projections. So we're waking from that, thinking it's other people. We wake up from that sleep, thinking it's our own projection. Then when you're falling asleep into thinking it's all my projection, then you're, even your projections are, are not, uh, not independently existing. They are, they are like illusion. So you have to wake up from that sleep. Uh, and then uh, when you know that things are Ill illusion doesn't mean uh, that doesn't exist. Illusions are interdependently originated. Even illusion needs to know a lot of causes of condition. Then you realize, oh, illusion is not a not a way of dismissing non non-existing illusion. Is a just just saying everything is interdependent originated. When you know everything is interdependent originated, Buddha knows everything is interdependent originated. Deluded people think, no, this is the cause. They point one finger to something, and they think that's going to solve the problem. That actually exacerbates the problem. Nobody wants to take responsibility. They wanted to point finger to one. That unitary cause of existence, that one thing causing everything is a fallacy number one. Thinking that is permanent is fallacy number two. Thinking that is independently happening is fallacy number three. So if you have true refuge, one has to learn how to not fall into this, those three pitfalls of wrong views. And, but therefore, instead, everything is interdependently originated. And what is interdependently originated yeah, uh, does, means nothing is true independently existing and nothing inherently exists. And when you are able to do that, then you have, you have true safety. To safety from pointing your crooked finger to someone or even to yourself. None of these independently exists. Only uh, something only exists in relationship with somebody, something else. When you take into account all things, then you realize, aha, uh -huh, and then you sit back and do not get into that pointing finger at anyone or anything, because nothing is the true cause of everything. Everything is mutually, codependently created. Not knowing these childish beings throw, at e throw stone at each other, alas. Then you have the true refuge. Then you have true power to practice compassion for those who haven't got this vision and understanding. That is refuge. Then you can develop compassion to those who are not able to see that, but instead of reacting, overreacting, punishing as if it's their fault. You know, if, you, if you're no longer doing this, then you can see the refuge. Then a lot of, how do you know you have true refuge? You sleep well. You digest food well, your greed is decreasing, you have very little enmity at all because you have greed is decreased. And you, you have very little ignorance because everything is impermanent, not truly existing. And this is constant 
thought of yours. Now the Buddha thought has become yours. You know, you have you have the biggest importation of this this idea from the Buddha through your meditation, self-discipline. Your thought is always able to see that in everyday situation, and therefore you are very hesitant to to voice your your deluded concerns because you are able to see your deluded concerns, and you're not going to subscribe to that deluded concern, and you are going to restrain from outputting any words or deeds that, that manifest your delusion. You are, you are trying to restrain your own physical, verbal, negative karma because you are able to know how to restrain them. As soon as you restrain them, the problem doesn't really truly exist there because the source has been blocked. So you are able to truly stop the true origin of suffering and the suffering itself that you see of other sentient beings become constant cause of your compassion, not cause of your rejection of sufferings of others or denial of them or like that. You will, no matter how and who in your life, your life has problem, you you'd become most compassionate and a uh, carer and giver and patient and generous person you, you will have, you will become. Why? You have true refuge. You have true refuge. You're not inconveniencible by other people's difficulties. You are actually made more resourceful uh, when someone is difficult. You know, uh, resourceful doesn't mean like lots of lots of material things. Me talking about inner resource. This is a gem. This is the gem that you can now mine because your mind has has been opened like a mine, and because you you have opened the mine of your mind, if you like. You know, I don't know why this. Two, world, two words rhyme. One is mind, other is mind. Yeah, wait until you are able to mind your mind. When you have done that, then you have truly found a refuge. Semgi tambatela chaksal rese. I pay homage to the sacredness of the, that holy mind. When you have come to learn to change, modify your mind, then your true refuge has completely empowered you. How do you know you have true refuge? There's a lot of clarity, a lot of lightness, a lot of gentleness. And, and every suffering and problem of sentient beings you see, you do, they don't depress you. They, can't, they just arouse empathy and compassion in you. And so their, their suffering isn't, isn't a cause of trouble and worry to you. Their cause of suffering to you is cause of resilience. So the suffering of pandemic or whatever it is that you can't go there, can't do the can't do. these things does not become cause of your impatience and intolerance. These things become cause your own inner resourcefulness. Because your study and meditation and sadhana has almost made your mind to be reconstituted in that manner. If you witness that, then your faith in the Buddha is is not going to be, you know. Uh, reversible by any upset or disappointment in life, let alone your faith in the Dharma, let alone your faith in the Sangha. All the Sanghas who might be falling all over the place, whatever, but still uh, you will not be losing your faith in the Dharma or because you have true refuge. You know, you're no longer, you know, Engaging in drama of some difficulties there, karma of some people ripens as you haven't got yours, and you don't throw the dust because half of them will fall on your head, if not most of it. So you will you have this you have the true refuge of not creating, reacting, overreacting your childish uh, behavior or your body or thoughts or speech or whatever. You no longer do that. Why? You have refuge. You have refuge of not harming anyone. Even if somebody harmed somebody, that's your perception. How do you know who harmed who? Nobody harms anybody, but remember that. True origin of harm is one's own karma and affliction. Buddha never said, those who harm you, go and st throw stone at them, prove that they are wrong, tell the whole world this person did this. Buddha never said that. That's a Judeo Christian. This zero tolerance philosophy, whoever propagates, says that. Buddhism never teaches that. Buddhism says practice kindness, practice tolerance, practice nonviolence. So, therefore, neo Buddhist 
recent years totally misunderstand Dharma and they still bring this, this their own unresolved Judaic Christian sort of bacteria in their mind and then think the, how they, they try to interpret Buddhism from that point of view. That's because they haven't had refuge, true refuge. The true meaning of refuge is not merely because you change your name or went through a ceremony or whatever. No, true meaning of refuge is where you have the amazing sense of growth and uh, what you call uh, uh, unfolding in your mind. Through your meditation discipline, this true sense of refuge will make you to save, practice safe thoughts, practice safe um, words. These are refuge. These are true refuge. There is no consideration what one does have any consequences. Other people doing has a lot of consequences that you can all throw a stone at him or her. Your throwing stone has no consequences. Of course, it will get you. It will probably land on your head more than anybody else. The one who doesn't do that is what we call have, have true meaning of refuge. Even if throw, people throw stone at, at you, whatever, they, you still practice tolerance and kindness and even admit your own share of mistake. That's true meaning of refuge. That is resilience. This will teach you power to uh, power to be not intimidate yourself. That you they can't other harm does not intimidate you, but it arms you with compassion. Why Avalokita has shown many arms because you have infinite ways of transmitting and radiating act of compassion to allay the suffering and difficulties of others. And by doing so, it doesn't sort of deplete your goodness, because you haven't got, uh, because you have, you have, you have got huge stock of gems of dharma. You have refuge in the dharma, so your your your, your stock is not running out. It's like a reservoir. The more you practice tolerance, the more it convinces you that's the only way. So it's not zero tolerance. It's more increasement of 20%, 30% tolerance. So 0% tolerance is very materialistic, very, very black and white, dualistic. I don't know whose philosophy it is. It definitely has nothing to do with Buddhism. Why Buddhism has to be very distinct? Those who practice that inspires people is because they would not resort to any form of retaliation uh, or, 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 or violence, even if the other does, because he knows he has to take responsibility, if not what the person does, but what he, how he responds uh, to it and not against it, because then he's, he's trying to save them from future suffering by not reacting, not because so trying to f- try to find who's right and who's wrong, but who has to be kind to relieve the temporary difficulties. When you do that, then you have the true meaning of refuge. You can see you're naturally calmed and tamed by this reflexive cognitivity of your own emotional growth, and as a result of that, it will never waste your tolerance. You will, you will never feel regret that you practice tolerance. But those who resort to reaction and overreaction and so on, they thought it was all right, everything they should do, do it together. But later on, they all feel they have alienated themselves from the very dharma they thought they were practicing. And where was their sangha? No, they, have, they haven't got anyone. They haven't got anyone because they took refuge in the Sangha as a, as a, as not as a fellow practitioner. They, they took refuge in the Sangha as saviors. When they didn't save, they turned the dirty back to them. And so they have no, no true refuge. Now where are they? They're back to square one, even worse when they started. Why? Because they didn't have the true refuge. The true meaning of refuge means uh, safety, you know. Firstly, safety of thoughts, minding what thoughts, let alone uh, opinionating or sharing that deluded opinion to others. One who is able to mind his own thoughts, that's refuge. That's real safety. One who does not react to his own bad thoughts, but try to cull it down by the practice of dharma, by his or her discipline, not merely donning on a robe or not merely saying I'm doing this, but actually shaving those defilements, you know, shaving those afflictions, shaving those ag- aggression is more important. That's why Mahayana Buddhism uh, promotes the, the, the need to mind your 
the attitude more than changing your outer dress, you know, because it is very, very easy to think that you have, you have, you have become, uh, become ordained or something when you haven't changed anything within. True refugees is where you no longer have to hide your own neurosis, but you confront them yourself and don't act as though you haven't got any neurosis. Because you do, because you do, everybody do. So it's not just only you. Everybody do. Why? Because they're born in this world with this corporal body. And so one who has true mean understand true refuge have lots of resilience, uh, being able to restrain one's uh, aggressive, uh, very uh, divisive, negative habits, and being able to calm them and so soften oneself. And then there's amazing relish, uh, relish meaning I'm saying the delight and bliss in the absence of ill will. You know, particularly, you know, compassion to those who, who, who are cause of your irritation, but you really see them as your most obvious cause of your compassion. They are the true teacher. True teacher, you should bow down to them, you know. So, so with this in mind, it's important to understand or practice resilience in the Buddhist context understand the true meaning of refuge. You know, when you have true meaning of refuge, uh, there's amazing, uh, uh, amazing, I would say, power uh, that you could not be harmed uh, by any difficulties that is, ex- that, 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 is, that, is, uh, that is actually directed to you. But instead, you utilize with empathy, transform them as your object of compassion and tolerance and forgiveness and therefore to help those who helped you to, you to exhaust your own karma. When you think like that, then you have no ill will and enmity towards others. Why? Because you have true refuge. Because you are, you are, you are suffering proof. You know, when you are su- suffering, is, suffering is not found in one who has refuge. Uh, so compassion is found in one who has refuge with other sentient beings who have suffering. So this is doubly meaningful, win-win situation. So it's, it's important to therefore use our conventional uh, knowledge and study and practice of the Dharma, uh, meditation and prayers and sadhana and mantra that actually slowly it's causing to uh, to enrich this growth and uh, this uh, restitution in your own mind and therefore change your whole psychophysical constitution as well. You can definitely cure even your illnesses, prevent them from spreading very far and slow the spread of the illnesses and at least mentally not develop any anxiety because your body is basically decaying with or without illness. So why you get attached to something that is not really, not really worthy, mm, not worthy. Uh, it's just like some of the ice cream cones, you know. Uh, some people, some people, the, the very cone that on the ice cream that is put in the thing itself is edible they hope they thought there was some kind they can keep that as a cone no they, they itself it will slowly slowly melt with the ice cream so so do not do, even if you do not have any illnesses this body is still to be decayed anyway you know doesn't mean the body which has no any illness will remain ever so young and beautiful no it also will be decayed look at the mortal statues that people put on they are all brought down by recent recent people they are all all dust to dust, and they they no longer are some some heroes in the public park anymore. Look at those change of the change of situation. So nothing is permanent; everything is transient. So therefore, uh, uh, therefore, our body mm, uh, is should be good. You know, if body is suffering certain wear and tear and aging and decaying, we should we should be not intimidated by it. that. Is a resilient one who has refuge in understanding the nature of the Dharma. And nature of the mind, the body is, of course, showing its sign of decay. It's automatic. So think the one who thinks I'm body, they will suffer. They will have no resilience because they are, they identify themselves with the body. You know, they don't see the body <laughs> as as a as a case of the thing itself is not there. The, even the thing inside the case itself is not there. How could you try to protect the case? 
Ah, so that's why resilience mainly comes from non-attachment, whatever that it is. Not only self, but even the body, or health, or even your ideas. You want only your ideas to be heated to. If that does not get heated to, then you get really frustrated. See, that's the lack of resilience comes from your attachment to things. You need to work with, work with things gently for the benefit of all, not just to have your way. Your own way and wanting your own way is often the cause of the conflict and stress. So resilience to, to work with others, mm, to give in to others for the sake of uh, harmony and friendship and try to work or to try to assist each other. And this will greatly uh, teach uh, resilience. Uh, so with this, I will conclude here. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, Next Sunday, of course, uh, we might have our sessions uh, uh, to celebrate His Holiness Dalai Lama's birthday. Uh, so um, we will let you know. We we might do a sixteen hara puja. I don't know whether we will do online or still online, but at the center we don't know yet. Uh, but of course, you can still participate in one way or another. Thank you very much for joining us then. Uh, so I will do the dedication of marriage. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Take care.